Reagan from Peru's project put out a video recently, uh, overhyped books, books that she felt didn't live up to the hype. It was a super fun video. I really enjoyed it. It's linked in the description. And I love doing these types of videos too. It's fun, it's lighthearted, and I get to let off a little bit of steam. So I decided to do it too. Check out her video first, then, you know, watch mine if you feel like it. But I'm gonna talk about a few books that have a, an absolute ton of hype around them that I read and I either blatantly didn't like or at least thought, yeah, it was good, but I don't get the hype or at least not the extent of it. Before we get into that mess, a shout out to today's sponsor, Bright Cellars. Bright Cellars is a wine subscription service that matches you with wines from all over the world curated to fit your palate. All you have to do is take their quick and simple seven question quiz so that they can gather your taste preferences and deliver wines that you're guaranteed to love. You'll answer questions like what your favorite chocolate is, what kind of tea you like to drink, and each box is completely unique to your taste palette. They also send the wine directly to your door, which is a huge bonus for me because I want to like wine or have wanted to like wine and would go to the store, pick out a bottle that I had hoped was good, and then half the time ended up not even liking it. So between the wine being curated to you and it being delivered to your door, the convenience of this service is incredible. Each box also comes with wine education cards for each bottle that outline the tasting notes, suggested pairings, best serving temperature, and origin. They also show you how to store and open your wine, keeping it tasting fresh for longer. I have learned so much already about what I like in wine, which helps me to then with my next box, even curate it a little bit closer because they also allow you to, uh, once they match you with your wines, you can say, no, that one doesn't look good, or no, I have an allergy to that is significant for me. And then they'll just swap it out with a new suggestion. So it's so customizable. And as I'm learning what I love, I can customize it even more and get sent really tasty wines. And if you use the link in my description, you get 50% off of six bottles, which including shipping is only $55 for six bottles of wine. Plus by checking out the sponsor, it directly supports my channel. I have had a great experience with Bright Cellar, so I highly recommend. And I'll be answering these questions with a glass of meat cute. Okay, into the books. We're gonna start on one that I think is kind of controversial because it's recent. I think books that have had a little bit of time, it's okay to say I didn't feel the hype, but if it's recent and the hype is still large, it's not really okay to say it. So we're gonna start here. Project Hail Mary. I enjoyed this book. I had a good time reading it. It was a fun time, but I don't think about it that much. And coming out of it, I just felt like, yeah, I liked it, but why does everybody love it to the extent that they do? There's only one thing that I loved about this book, and that was a specific character that I won't mention because this character doesn't come, doesn't be, this character isn't brought up until about the halfway point of the book. But if you don't know, Project Hail Mary is about a man who wakes up in, who wakes up from stasis, I almost said in stasis, from stasis. He has been put on a ship to go out into space to save humanity because, you know, the world's gonna, you know, the basic sci-fi start but he also has lost his memories. So half of this book is told in the now where he's trying to do what he needs to do in order to save everybody. And part of it is told in the then as we're getting flashbacks, we're getting little snippets of his memories returning and we're starting to see who he was before he was in space, what his career was, what his personality was, who he interacted with and very slowly unravel how he got here, which is, it was really fun. I enjoyed uh, slowly unraveling all that. So that said, we're, we're here alone with him in space because it's only him. And then we interact with a lot of characters in the past. So anyway, there's one thing about this book that I say is phenomenal, excellent, read the book for this thing, and that is a single character that comes in later in the story that is one of my favorite characters that I've read this year. And I loved this character, and I loved every scene he was in, and if you've read the story, you know who I'm talking about because this character was the shining star of the book. And I did like everything else. I enjoyed the slow unraveling. I enjoyed the formatting. I liked our main character well enough. I liked everything about this book. It's not a negative feeling that I have for this book, but I do think that everything about this book minus that one character is kind of just like standard 
sci-fi, standard hopeful sci-fi. You have hopeful sci-fi, and then you have sci-fi that takes a close look at the failings of humanity. This was a hopeful sci-fi, and it was, you know, the setup was standard, the story was standard, I just, it was fine. I had a good time with it, it was fine. I don't understand the hype. And in fact, if the hype weren't so strong, I would have read it, said positive things about it, and then promptly forgotten about it. But it's like loved, like intensely loved. And I don't get it. Next we'll talk about an oldie but a goodie and that's Nevernight. I'll keep it brief because I have entire rants on my channel about this book, which I will link if you haven't seen them. This book is so well loved, it is wild to me. I mean, some of my closest friends on booktube, this is their favorite book. And we've had long conversations about it and I'm happy for anyone that loves anything. I want people to love the things that they read. I want people to find joy in their lives. So please love this book. But oh my goodness, do I not? Not only is it written like someone who desperately wants to be poetic but cannot figure out how. I mean, Kristoff's prose in this book are obnoxious. I'm so sorry if this is one of your favorites, but obnoxious. In one of my videos that I linked, I actually read a couple of quotes from it, so maybe maybe you'll see if you check out that video, which you should. I was angry. So not only was getting through his book painful to me, because half the time I'm like, do you even know what you're saying? Do you even know what you're saying? I don't think you do. I think you're just trying to sound pretty. But also we have that standard female protagonist that it's like the author wants her to be inspiring and cool and edgy, but he tries so hard and it just doesn't land for me. She has all these really over the top, edgy thoughts that just make it feel so try hard to me. Plus her whole story is I'm out for revenge. That's her character trait at the beginning of the book. And I'm compel compelled by that. I love a good revenge story. This was not a good revenge story, at least not the first book. I didn't continue with the series. I won't, don't try to convince me to. But her whole personality trait at the beginning was I'm out for revenge, which I mean, go girl, I wanna see it. But then her personality shifts to I'm in love with a guy that's really all I care about. Also magical boob job to make me more desirable. Also teachers teaching us how to have sex by having sex with us. Thanks teach. It happened to a different student, not to our main character. I mean, there were so many things in this book that I was like, but why? Why'd we do it? It didn't need to be here. We didn't have to do this. Anyway, after her personality shifts for, from I'm out for revenge to I'm in love, I don't really think about the revenge thing too much, every now and then it comes up, to the ending of the book, which was in, admittedly explosive and exciting. But if you take a step back and you think about it, I just don't believe that Mia, I'm pretty sure that was her name. I read it over a year ago. I don't believe that Mia would go for the person, love interest wise, that she went for because her whole personality trait was out for revenge. And then it's like, you have to remove yourself from this character's motivations entirely to believe in this, in, in the direction the romance goes. I think that's about as specific as I can be, but if you've read it, you know what I'm saying. I didn't continue on with the story. I'm sure it's magnificent moving forward. I will never find out. Jane Eyre. This is a classic and it is a well-loved classic. And you know, when you talk about the Bronte sisters, you talk about Jane Eyre, which is this wonderful, extraordinary story. And you talk about Wuthering Heights, which is this devastating, sad story, stay away from it. So many people don't like Wuthering Heights. I loved it because it was such a close look into the cycle of abuse. And it was just such an amazing conversation. And then you have Jane Eyre, which is like boring, 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 unhealthy romance that is romanticized, unsatisfying ending. Cool. I'm actually gonna reread Jane Eyre eventually. This is one that I do want to give another try because when I read it, I was just like, I don't understand why people like this. Um, but I do want to try again because I read this, I think, before I was as much of a themes reader as I am now, and I really wanna try it again and see if there were some themes in there that I missed, like with Wuthering Heights. I think that it's really easy to just get caught up in how sad it is and, and miss the conversation. 
Not to say if you didn't like the book, you missed some. I'm not trying to be that guy. But, you know, you know what I mean. It's really easy to get caught up in what's right in front of you and not appreciate what the author was trying to discuss, which you don't have to appreciate, you don't have to like it. But with Jane Eyre, I think it's possible that I just missed something. So I'm gonna try again someday. I haven't worked up the courage, but regardless, it was very overhyped for me. Shifting focus a little bit onto authors, and as I do that, I'll be drinking a glass of main character. Sarah J. Mass. I hesitate to have her on this list because like anything that's really, really popular, especially something that's YA, uh, you have the people who die hard love it, aggressively love it, and then you have the people that aggressively hate it because it's popular, and I don't want to be that person. So I hesitate to even have this on the list, but it would be dishonest not to because I have tried several of her books and I just don't like them. Just know that I'm coming at this from the perspective of genuinely they're not the books for me and, and not just being mad that an author is successful. Sarah J Mass, I do not like her books. I read the first, I think, two or three Throne of Glass books before I quit. It's like you, eventually you just need to be willing to say, this is not working for me. But just speaking about the first book, because it was the worst. Actually, I didn't finish book three. I only got about halfway through with it before I was like, I gotta stop. It's just, it's not, it's not, it's not working. But just talking about book one, because that's the one that I remember the most, Throne of Glass, is I, <sighs> so, we follow an assassin, and it is that same thing that I talked about with Nevernight, just less egregious, that she is this, this strong, powerful, mean, edgy girl, but it's fine, because she's the protagonist. She is an assassin, and she's really skilled. She's really, really capable. She knows what she's doing. We're told. We don't see. We see it a little bit more in future books, but honestly, not that much, at least not as far as I got into the series. Apparently we see it in the prequel book, but I couldn't be bothered. But she is so in her head, hyping herself as if she is a paid hype man, and we never see her actually be what she claims to be. Like she will walk into a room and she will have this long inner monologue going on and on about how she could take out each person in this room, how she could do it, how she could make her escape, how she could be the biggest, baddest lady in all of the land, but we never see it. Again, you see it a little bit more in the later books, but still not enough for how much she hypes herself. Plus she's really stupid. She's an assassin in an assassin competition. So there are other people in this competition that are killers and they're trying to win the position of gaining their freedom back by being the best assassin. If I'm remembering the plot correctly, I know it's something along those lines. Maybe I didn't describe it perfectly, but it was good enough. And she wakes up one morning with some chocolates by her bed that somebody left she doesn't know who or when or why they broke into her room in the middle of the night to give her chocolates and she eats them. Girl, do you know where you are? Plus I just wasn't into the romance. Just nothing about the book worked for me. Then I read A, thor a, thor a cor Court of Thorn and Roses and I didn't like that either. I actually was pretty okay with it, but there were some scenes in that book that were just all kinds of messed up that I was just, I just don't understand why people don't talk about it. Actually, people probably do talk about it, so never mind, forget me. But there were some scenes in that book that were all kinds of messed up, plus I hate, and when I say hate, I mean despise Resand, Rysand. And I know, I know, he had reasons for all the things he did, he has excuses, he has, he has, he has explanations that will make you forget all the horrible, disgusting things he did in the first book and make you love him in the next one. I despise him and I have absolutely zero interest in being convinced that he's, that it was all for the right reasons. Like, no, this man, I, will, I have no interest in having him redeemed. I mean, you do you. I'm sure the explanations are wonderful, but I, have no interest. On that track, we'll talk about another author that I feel is overhyped, and that's Stephen King. Now, again, this is one of those authors that, or one of the things on the list, that it's not like I dislike his books as a whole. I've actually, I've read about eight of his books, I think. One I absolutely loved. It made my favorite books of the year list. Is it still? Yep, it's still outward facing on my bookshelf. 
I'll just grab it. Pet Cemetery loved and adored this book. I have hyped it. In fact, I probably overhyped this book for a lot of you. And I've liked several of his books that I've read. I've also completely disliked some of the books that, that he's written. The reason I say he's overhyped, here's the thing. I think that Stephen King is a really skilled writer. Like he, he writes suspense incredibly well. He writes well-layered and well-motivated characters incredibly. He writes the feeling of unease brilliantly. And he has really interesting and engaging plots. I think he is a great writer. <laughs> until he's not. He has scenes in his books that make me think his editors secretly hate him. Because if they liked him, they would say, nah, man, don't, don't keep this in here, you weirdo. And I'm not even talking about the one scene in It. I haven't even read It, so I don't really get to have an opinion on it, but I do know that I probably won't read it because of that one scene. But I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about the books that I have read that have really weird scenes in them that just don't need to be there. Like, write them out, embrace your weird self, but don't keep them in the book to be published. Like, they don't even benefit the plot. They're just, they just don't need to be there. Plus, I think that King writes incredibly interesting, compelling, suspense-filled, gripping stories until he doesn't. He is notorious for having terribly unsatisfying endings to his books. And I won't say that that's true for all of his books because some of his books I've found very satisfyingly ended, ended. But most of them that I've read, and again, I've read about eight, aren't. And I know King fans all the time respond with, well, those weird scenes, well, those bad endings, you know, he was on a lot of drugs for a while there or he's written a lot of books. So, you know, some of them are gonna be duds. I don't care if he was on drugs or not. It's still a bad book or a bad scene. Like, I don't know why we're just shrugging our shoulders and being like, ah, drugs. It does, it's still bad. It's still not good. The, all that said, I'm not done with King. I still plan on reading a few of his books. I'm still, I still think that he is a fantastic writer in a lot of ways and I, I, I get why people like him, I really do. I just don't understand why he's like one of the most well-known and revered writers ever, at least in current times. He's one of the most well-known and, and revered writers, modern, modern writers. And I just, I get why people love him. It makes sense to me, but I don't understand why he's this hyped. This video is already getting kind of long, so I'm gonna cut a couple of these. Next, we'll talk about Jade City and Jade War. I know Jade's Legacy just came out. I'm probably not gonna read it. Jade City, I thought was, it's it's like this mafia-esque uh, story. It's modern-ish fantasy. It's so hyped on booktube. And it seems like the majority of people that love this story this hard are usually saying, the political intrigue is so gripping and so thrilling and so masterfully woven. And I agree that politically it is a really, it's well written, but it's also boring. I read Jade City and I just felt like it just wasn't very interesting until the end. And the end I thought was so exciting and had such an amazing setup for the sequel that I came off of Jade City saying, oh, I really liked this. But then I read Jade War and I realized that a lot of what I loved about Jade City was what it set up for the next book, the potential of what it brought to the series. And then I read Jade War and it was just still so boring. Like, yes, the politics are really well written. It's very well written, but also it's just like not that interesting. I don't know, it just, it could not, it couldn't hook me. I mean, I enjoy a good, well-paced, a good, slow-paced story. And I just don't, didn't, it wasn't this one for me. Finally, I'm gonna end this video on what is both maybe not so controversial, but also extremely controversial. I'll explain. And the final question will be accompanied with a glass of Cabin 5. The thing is, so I'm ending it on The Great Gatsby. And the reason I say that it's both not that controversial and very controversial is, again, it's a classic. And I feel like once we get some distance from books, more people have varying opinions and it's not 
such a big deal. But at the same time, The Great Gatsby is so hyped. It's like the great American novel. I've seen people say it should absolutely be required reading in every single school system. When I said I didn't read it in school, I got multiple comments of people saying, what was your school doing growing up? How did they fail you? I mean, truly this book is revered by some as the greatest thing that has ever happened to literature. And I didn't dislike it. In fact, I enjoyed it. And I do want to give it another go now that I, I'm a different reader than I used to be, so I feel like I do have more potential to even appreciate it more than I did originally, but I enjoyed it originally. Like, I didn't have negative feelings about it. I just don't get the level of hype. I do think it was good. I think it had some good conversations. I thought it had a compelling story, compelling characters. I, I think that it was good. I enjoyed it. But when I said I enjoyed it, but I don't understand why people consider it the greatest feat in literature, you should have seen some of the comments. I mean, it's fine. I don't care if you disagree with me. I just don't understand why this is regarded as highly as it is. I wanna reread it. Maybe I'll understand it on reread. I thought it was good. I don't get the level of hype. Actually, I just remembered one more, so let me tell you one more. Kafka on the Shore. I'll keep it brief, because again, it has its own video, and I've talked about it a few times. Haruki Murakami is just so loved as an author, just so loved, including here on BookTube, but also just worldwide. He's a genius, apparently, which makes me an idiot, I guess. I've read two of his books, uh, Sputnik Sweetheart, I liked. I, it made me more intrigued to read more of his books than it made me excited about that book, if that makes sense. He's a very, he's, he's, he's an author that really leans on concepts. He loves having this kind of, um, this, this world where supernatural, odd, magical things are kind of, you dip in and out of them, and sometimes you don't even know which side of it you're in until you're deeply in it. These odd abstract things happen and they're never really explained, and you're left with these open endings where, at the end of the book, a lot of times you just wonder, how does this all connect? And you're left with kind of an open puzzle where Murakami has, put a few pieces together, but then you're allowed to discuss and, and theorize and wonder and try to fit the pieces together yourself. I really like these concepts. And I also think that some of the conversations he has, some of the philosophizing he does within the book, I think some of it is interesting. I think some of it is not. I really like the idea of his books, but especially Kafka on the Shore, but Sputnik Sweetheart too. I feel like in order to fully enjoy his books, you have to kind of willfully forget some of the stuff that's in there, much like King, but on steroids. There are things in his books that I'm just like, I don't know that your editors like you. Why did they let you keep that in there? Again, I've talked about this book a lot recently. Well, not a lot, but several times recently. So I'm just gonna direct you to my review where I actually had screenshots of things in the book <laughs> that I just, I just don't, I just don't think needed to be there. I mean, stuff that just physically, biologically doesn't make sense. And it's not even one of those wibbly wobbly, you know, magic is in this world, strange things are happening. It's just, it's just, it doesn't work. Plus he's so gratuitous whenever he wants to talk about something disturbing. I mean, he, he just, he's one of those authors that's like, I don't wanna just talk about disturbing things in the world. I wanna really rub your face in it. I wanna cram it down your throat. And that's just like, it's just not my jam. I don't know, I just think this author isn't for me. And again, you know, he's so well loved. So don't take my word for it, but this is an opinions video, so there's mine. There you go, those are some books that I feel were overhyped for me. That doesn't mean that they're bad books, it just means that the hype is so strong. And while I can understand love for these books, it makes sense to me. I don't understand, like it feels a little bit disproportionate to what I read. But that's cool. Reading is a very subjective thing, so we're going to have differing opinions for sure. Also, I am very guilty of overhyping my favorite books. Like I get so many comments of people reading my favorites and coming back and saying, I don't, it wasn't that good, I don't get it. And that's cool, That that's fine. Hopefully you've also found some that you like through my channel. And if not, 
I'm really sorry. But anyway, don't forget to check out Bright Sellers. Be sure to chat with me more in the comments. Feel free to roast some of my favorites. What are some books that were overhyped for you? Have at it. Or if one of your favorite books or authors were on this list, feel free to tell me what you love about them. I would love to have that discussion. It's not that it would change my opinion, but it always is nice to get differing opinions. I post videos every Monday and Friday, but I will soon be posting, I think Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, probably starting in May. So keep an eye out for that. Plus I have a second channel where I post vlogs. So reading vlogs and what I'm reading and what I'm doing throughout my week. So there's four videos a week, really, at least starting in May. All linked in the description. Just go check out the description. I'll see you again soon, bye.